In front of my place on Maui, there is a beautiful set of 11 or 12 palm trees. And these are like 30, 40, 50 feet tall. They've been there for, I don't know how long, decades. And when the winds come and when the storms come, the storms will blow them over. There they are, watch. And they're just these amazing elastic things. I learned so much from these things. I go out there, when I, would, when I did these, when I wrote the uh, essay in the book on the verse 73, I just went out there with the palm trees and I would just commune with these palm trees. And they go all the way up and then they come all the way back. That's a symbol for how we need to think in our own lives. In verse 73 it says, it is heaven's way to conquer without striving. It does not ask, yet it is supplied with all that it needs. It does not hurry, yet it completes everything on time. One of my favorite lines from the Tao, one of my favorite beliefs from the Tao is this, that you're doing nothing. All of you, you're doing nothing. You're just being done. Just like you were the first nine months of your life. You think you're out there and you're making this happen and you're making that happen and you've got all these rigid things and, and you have to apply your life this way. You're not doing anything. Any more than you were having your fingernails show up when they were supposed to. And look at you. Look at all of you. Look around. You know, it's like, you know, what held it in yesterday? You know? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not doing anything. They fall out and... Uh, and they don't fall out no matter how hard I try to keep them in there. Finally, my kids said, give it up. <laughs> give it up. So I was over in England, and they told me that I couldn't take my shampoo bottles on the plane. And there's nothing you can do about it. I said, yes, there is. <laughs> I'll just shave my head. <laughs> I no longer need shampoo. <laughs> okay. So we want to move from stiffness to flexibility. The next thought that I'd like to see us change, that the Tao taught me so much, was living by interfering to shift that to living by not interfering. Do you know that every one of your children have the anchor of the universe located within them? <laughs> and that Khalil Gibran, this is a paraphrase, he said, your children are not your children. They are the products of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not for you. They're not there for you. So what are you doing interfering in their lives? Now, I'm not talking about letting them play out in the traffic <laughs> or play at the edge of a swimming pool if they don't know how to swim. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, I called this when I, was, uh, when I was working on this and living this and practicing this for that full year of 2006, the bite your tongue. Zip your lip. Verses of the Tao. Verse 29 of the Tao. Do you think you can take over the universe and improve it? I do not believe it can be done. Everything under heaven is a sacred vessel and cannot be controlled. Trying to control leads to ruin. Trying to grasp, we lose. Allow your life to unfold naturally. Allow other people's lives to unfold naturally as well. We have parents, I see them a lot, they're called helicopter parents. Because <laughs> they're always hovering. They're hovering over their kids and they're telling them what to do and what not to do. And my son came over from England, my son Shane, and uh, he was going to get ready to go to college, go to college in America. And my wife said to me, uh, so you're going to take him uh, and show him how, about registration, right? I said, oh yeah, I'll be doing that. <laughs> she said, well, make sure that you help him because he doesn't know, have any idea how to register at the school, this great big school with thousands of people. I said, yeah, and I do, right? <laughs> I, I'm, I would know how to register kids at school, you know? And so uh, Shane got in the car and uh, I said, it's all going to be fine. You'll all be fine. And we drive over to the campus, and I drop him off, and I have my tennis racket in the back. And he said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm a prophet. I said, uh, I get paid by the thought. And uh, I have a tennis match, and then I have to walk on the beach so that I get paid by the thought. He said, but what about the registration? I said, well, the registration, I said, you'll do a lot like I did 
when I learned to register. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, you'll just go up to the people and say, where is registration? <laughs> and they'll say, it's over there where all of those people are all lined up. Because I remember those days in a college of 40,000 students or so, finding out how to register. Tracy, did I take you to register, honey? No. <laughs> so he said, you mean you're just going? I said, yeah, you just go over there. I said, you want daddy to walk with you over and take you through graduate? You're 18 years old and you want daddy to register you? He said, oh, no, I wouldn't want that. <laughs> so we got home at the end of the, uh, the, end of the evening uh, when, I, when I got back home and... Uh, my wife had said to me, she said, did you help Shane at registration? Oh, I said, I gave him so much help. Probably the most help he ever had in his life. <laughs> I taught him how to do things for himself. <laughs> and so that I wouldn't have to be interfering and hovering over and figuring it all out for them. My children know that when their science project comes up, that I'm there for consultation, but I pass science. <laughs> I got through that myself. And you'll be doing your own science project. If I can help you, I'd be happy to help you. But I'm not going to be getting the glue and figuring out how to make a time clock and all of that. I said, you know, just, just look at a clock. That's how you tell time for me, whatever it might be. And, and it's, it's not an uncaring and it's not a callous attitude at all. It's an awareness that your children have the anchor of the universe located within them. That's what Lao Tzu said. Now, my dear friend, who I love so much, She's right here in the audience, Carrie, right there, Carrie Evans from Maui. Um, she has two beautiful little daughters, and she asked me if I would watch them one afternoon when my grandson, Carter, was visiting. I said, uh, I'd be happy to watch them. She said, but you don't understand. I mean, they're going to they're gonna do this and they're going to do that. I said, you just go off, and she was studying for an exam. I said, you go study, do whatever you have to do. I can handle three little kids out at the swimming pool for three or four hours. I can handle that. So she went off, very nervous, gave me lists, told me what to do, what they might say, what they might not say. And then if she says, now if Kylie says this, you tell Kylie, and if Kamali says this, Kylie, Kamali, and Carter. All right? <laughs> so they go out there, and right here, is, there's a little pool over here, a little swimming pool. And um, I watch them over in the swimming pool, and Kylie uh, takes the water and splashes my grandson, uh, Carter, and splashes Kamali, and Kamali comes over to me and runs over within two minutes. Says, uh, Kylie splashed me. <laughs> well, of course, I'm working on the Tao. <laughs> Not interference. <laughs> and I said, uh, splashing, honey, is in the way of things. <laughs> when you're near water, splashing will take place. She says, yeah, but, but she splashed me. I said, you'll probably work this out. This will all be fine. And she stood there for the longest time with her little lip and so on, and finally she realized she wasn't getting anywhere with me. She went back. Before you know it, one of them had taken, now Kylie and Kamali are teaming up against Carter. And they pushed them under or whatever. Now, one of them is five, and one of them is four, and one of them is uh, seven or eight. And... Uh, Carter comes running over as fast as he can, runs over. He calls me Bampa. <laughs> I'm Grandpa. Bampa. 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 Miley. Miley pushed me under the water. I said, Carter, I'm a Taoist master. <laughs> but Bampa, Bampa, she pushed me. She put me under the water. I said, You'll just have to work this one out, Carter. I'm a Taoist master. This went on all for the, for the first hour or so. But I noticed as I was less interfering and less interfering that they were working it out. They tried again. After a few times, they'd come over and they wanted this and they wanted one of them push and one of that. But each time when I let them know that I was watching and making sure they were safe, but I wasn't going to interfere. I wasn't going to resolve it. I wasn't going to settle their disputes for them. I wasn't going to be a helicopter parent, even for an afternoon. And... The way that it re resolved itself was they have the anchor of the universe within them. They have a nature. They know what to do. One of my favorite things always to say to my children when there's a conflict is, you know what the right thing to do is. What do you think? You know. You have it in your heart. You are a divine being. They all know that. I've said those words to them over and over again. You'll figure it out. You'll work it out. Not, that, not I'm going to interfere. I'm going to tell them what to do. 
you can practice this so many places, so many ways in your life, particularly as parents, even in business. It's very important in businesses to allow the people to say at the end of the day, right out of the Tao, oh, we did that ourselves. We did it ourselves. Mm -hmm. In the Tao it says, there's a time for everything, and everything in its time. There's a time for everything. Listen to this. Uh, there's a time for being ahead and a time for being at peace. There's a time for being in motion and a time for being at rest. There's a time for being vigorous and a time for being exhausted. And in the Bible, to everything there is a season. A time for every purpose under the sun. I practice, this was so helpful to me, particularly as I do my yoga practice. In my yoga practice, it's, uh, <clears throat> there are some very exhausting po postures. I do this Bikram hot yoga, all right? So it's 105 or between 105 and 110 for 90 minutes. And, and there's one that uh, I used to hate. It's called triangle, you know? And so you put your foot out here and then you do this and then you get yourself up and you go all the way down and you get yourself in balance like here. So you balance, 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 and you take your arms out here and then you take these like this and it's 105 degrees in there. You take one and you're looking up here at your arm and you look and you look and you look and then you bring it back and it lasts a full minute. And I used to just wait for that minute to be over. Oh my God, when are they going to bring me out of this posture? It was so exhausting. I started practicing what the Tao teaches and I remember there's a time for being exhausted. There's a time for that. And as I practice that, I say, and there's a time for being at rest. And it's coming. Hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> but in your life, in your life there's an awareness that there is a time for all the things that are going on that you think shouldn't be happening. In the Tao it says that uh, hidden in all misfortune is good fortune. Hidden. In the misfortune that you have is good fortune because no storm can last forever. Even nature cannot create a storm that lasts forever. Ultimately, hidden within every storm is calmness. Hidden within every flood is drought and dryness. Hidden within all of the storms of your life is the peace that you desire. And it leans on you if you stop telling yourself and just let yourself go with it, to be at harmony with it rather than trying. You can see why this is called the wisest book ever written. And we're just touching on it here, just touching on this. Lao Tzu was green before Al Gore. <laughs> he was. This is verse 39 of the Tao Te Ching. When man interferes with the Tao, the sky becomes filthy, the earth becomes depleted, the equilibrium crumbles, creatures become extinct, therefore nobility is rooted in humility. Finally, I'd like to say to you, in understanding this idea of the Tao, is to take time yourself for being in nature. Take an hour a day every day of your life, take an hour a day, no matter how busy you are, no matter what scheduling that you have, to get out in nature, walk barefoot on the grass. Walk bare. It's one of the great uh, ways to overcome an inability to sleep at night. Just go out when you can't sleep and just walk on the grass, walk on the earth and reconnect yourself. Now, go out and be with the tree and look at what you can learn from nature. Look at these trees. Look at these animals. You can study. You look at that. Look at. I mean, you can study a flower like that that is so magnificent as it's unfolding. That's an actual photograph of this thing growing and unfolding there. You know, be with that. You have much to learn from nature, from water, from the sky, from the winds, from the trees, from the bird. From the more you do it, the more you see yourself in all of them the more you'll feel yourself as a connected being. Living the Tao. Another thought to change. To change from thinking big to thinking small. It's so much of the Tao has in it statements that seem so paradoxical and so confusing to us. More is less. Less is more. Um, think small, 
and get great things done, accomplish great things. Listen to verse 64 of the Tao Te Ching. A tree that fills a man's embrace grows from a seedling. A tower nine stories high starts with one brick. And here's the most famous line out of the Tao. A journey of a thousand miles begins with what? The first step. One first step. Okay? So, today, I can stand up here on this stage in this beautiful, sacred place, in this beautiful yin-yang symbol, on this incredibly beautiful set that feels so much like nature. And I can say to you that in a very short time, this year, I will have completed 20 years without taking a drink of alcohol. 20 years, okay? Thank you. Now that's big. That's big. Because I drank every day. Not to get drunk, but I drank every day. Two or three beers every evening after running, and it was like, and I couldn't remember a day when I hadn't had, I thought back 10 years, 12, I couldn't think of a day, not one day in the previous decade or two that I had uh, not had a beer or several beers. So that's big. And if I would have tried, if I'd have said to myself 20 years ago, Wayne, you're going to quit drinking for the next 20 years, I would have gone immediately and had a drink. <laughs> because it's just too big isn't it? It's just too big. You don't do big things. You do small things and thus accomplish great things. It's a very important distinction to make. Whatever it is that you would like to create or contribute or become in your life, take one step. How did I let drinking go for 20 years? And I don't even know about tomorrow. I never think about tomorrow and whether I'm going to have a drink. All I know for sure is that this won't be the day. I do it one day at a time. That's how you overcome anything called an addiction in your life. You take it, you reconnect yourself to the source from which you came, which is a source of what? Well-being, isn't it? And you get back and return, get on the return trip and say, I am connected to well-being. And I'll do this one day, one hour, one minute, one second, if I have to, at a time. And when you do it, I mean, it's behind in, in all of the programs for overcoming addictions. And all of the work of Bill W., all of the work of Alcoholics Anonymous, all of the work of any kind of addictions. It isn't just alcohol. It can be food. <laughs> It can be addiction to your emails. It can be addiction to work. It can be addiction to so many things that so many people find that they can't get past. And to move themselves into a place where I think small. I've run, I ran seven marathons in my running years. And about the 22nd or 23rd mile, you begin to ask yourself about your sanity. <laughs> <laughs> And what am I doing here? And my body is breaking down. But the way that you finish the marathon is not by saying, I'm going to run 26 miles. You don't do that, especially when you've still got five or six to go. You just say to yourself, can I put my foot in front of the next one? Can I take one step at a time? Can I do it one step at a time? And before you know it, you've accomplished great things.